Can you all hear me okay? Yeah? yeah? Cool. Awesome. So, I think in the interest of time, obviously a few more people might show up, but we can get things started. I know everybody's super busy, got things to do. I really appreciate you all being here to talk about networking with me. So, my name is Scott. I'm a senior career advisor at the RISD Career Center, also joined by my awesome colleague in the back, Brittany Soares, who's also a career advisor in our office. So, tonight, as you probably have guessed, I'm, my plan is to talk to you about networking, help you understand it. Um, if it's something that you feel kind of unsure of or intimidated by, um, hopefully you don't feel that way by the time the night is over and you feel more comfortable with it. Before I dive into my presentation, I always like to just get a sense of who's in the room. So if you don't mind, just like show of hands, is it undergrads? Are we undergrads? Mostly grad students, a couple, cool, awesome. Um, shout out just your you know majors, disciplines, what are you studying? GD. GD, sculpture. FAV. FAV. What else? Furniture. Furniture, nice. Anybody else? Say that again? Textiles. Textiles, nice, cool. Architecture. Architecture, so nice, nice mix. Any other fine art majors? Yep. Sculpture. Textiles kind of travel between the two sometimes, but yes, but want to do painting. Cool, nice, cool. Good for you being here, your first year at RISD, and it's uh, you're gonna you're ahead of the game, so that's awesome. Anybody else want to share? Okay, cool. And thank you to everybody who, who did the check-in too. It just kind of helps us know who who's coming to our events and, and who isn't, which helps us uh, reach more people too, which is useful. So, what are we gonna talk about? So, the three main things that I'm going to cover tonight are going to be really what is networking, because I think that's, it's a word that sometimes can be misunderstood, or people can kind of attach like negative vibes and feelings to, and understandably so in some cases, but hopefully by the time we're done, you have a deeper understanding of networking um, and feel better about what it is. Um, also going to share resources that you can use to network better. And then lastly, um, how to reach out to professionals. So one of the things that I encounter, and I think all of us in our office, encounter really frequently is people are like, I want to reach out to professionals. I want to talk to people. I want to you know, reach out to alumni and learn from their career paths. But I don't really know what to say. I don't know what the etiquette is around that. I don't know how to go about it which is a completely normal and understandable thing to feel that way. And hopefully by the end of the night, you have a better grasp on that and feel more comfortable with it. So that's the game plan. Sound good? Cool. And I should say, if at any point you all have questions or something isn't making sense or you want to clarify, raise your hand, interject. Like I'm down to you know have it be conversational and this does not have to be me just talking at you the whole time, so do not be afraid. If you have a question, chances are somebody else has that exact same question. So do not be shy to ask whatever's coming up in your mind. Cool. So to jump off, what even is networking? Like I said before, it's kind of a term that gets thrown around a lot. And sometimes we hear it and we're like, kind of have a vague sense that's something we should be doing, but we don't really know how to go about it or why it's valuable. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that. <clears throat> One thing I want to bring off or bring up right off the bat is you're all here at RISD, and so in this moment, you are already a part of the RISD community. So everybody, first of all, everybody who's in this room as a student, these people are already a part of your network because you have this shared RISD experience that you're going through together. Also, to the point of what's on the screen right now, you also share a RISD connection and a RISD community with alums. And so that's, you know, showing a select few for alums here that are really cool people who've done some impressive things. Won't go too deep into this, but Mar Figueroa is a, a RISD illustration alum who started their career doing really impressive freelance illustration for clients like Apple, Netflix, um, Nike, I believe, as well. And actually since then um, has transitioned into more of a fine art painting practice, which is um, really taking off for her and doing uh, really impressive work. So somebody who's really you know, straddled that design fine arts line in a really impressive way. 
Joe Gebbia is a GDID grad that many people might know the name, um, co-founded Airbnb. So somebody who's definitely gone on to have a really impressive entrepreneurial uh, career path post RISD. Similarly, Elisa Jean Charles, illustration grad who founded Healthy Roots Dolls, which is a company that uh, designs and makes dolls uh, specifically for girls of color. Um, and that was an idea that started in a RISD illustration class and then was developed, and now you can find Yelitsa's dolls in Targets across the country, which is pretty sweet. So somebody who, again, like really impressive entrepreneurial career path. And then lastly, Kara Walker, who's a very well-known artist, um, installation artist, painter, printmaker, um, does a lot of work based around, you probably are familiar, but does a lot of work based around kind of race and sexuality, um, and is one of RISD's MacArthur Genius Award winners, which if you've never heard of it, is a pretty ridiculous award. So you get $500,000, no strings attached, to advance your practice and do what you want, which is like pretty amazing. There's a very slim amount and percentage of people who found this award. I'm showing these examples, like one, because they've done really cool things. They represent like what's possible with a RISD education, but also to reinforce the fact that these people all went through the same classes, experience that you're going through, right? And so again, like, these people are part of your community. Even though they've, like, gone on to achieve all these amazing things, these people are part of your network, kind of whether you're aware of it or not yet. Um, so just keep that in mind, and hopefully that's, like, a um, cool thing to, to take with you as you leave tonight. I also want to share just some of my some quotes on networking that I've come across over the years that I think are are good to keep in mind and help kind of frame what networking is really all about. So this one is, networking is more quality and less quantity. It's better to form a solid connection with one new person than a liquid connection with 10. So basically what that's saying is that networking is not about how many people you know. It's not about being able to say I have 100 professional connections, 200 professional connections. It's more about the quality of those connections and what you gain from them and what you learn from them and what you're able to share with that person. So just keep that in mind when you think about networking. Another quote is, if we create networks with the sole intention of getting something, we won't succeed. We can't pursue the benefits of networks. The benefits ensue from investments in meaningful activities and relationships. So I think this one is just a good reminder that um, the things that you are passionate about and the communities that you join are ways for you to authentically and organically develop a network. So like an example of this that you might think about is if you're a part of like a student club or an organization on campus that aligns like just off the top of my head, um, the Brown RISD Game Developers Association if you're interested in like gaming and game design. That group, you join that group because you're interested in that kind of work, because you're excited by that kind of stuff. But that actually, like that genuine, authentic passion for that kind of work is actually helping you create a network. Like you join that group and those people become a part of your network and they are a part of your network now and even lasting after you graduate too. So you'll see this pattern throughout the talk tonight, but just keep that in mind that like sometimes a network comes from finding community and finding groups that you feel like authentically connected to and aligned with. So just keep that in mind. And then this one is networking is not just about connecting people. It's about connecting people with people, people with ideas, and people with opportunities. So I think the main takeaway here is that, again, it's not just about being able to say, I know this person or I'm connected to this person. It's more about what do you derive from that relationship? What are they sharing with you? What are you able to share with them? Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but uh, what opportunities are you gaining access to because of your network and because of the relationships that you've built that maybe you wouldn't have access to otherwise? Another important thing, again, this kind of goes back to this point of like, the networking word kind of having a negative connotation sometimes. The network is really just a support group of people. Then those people might be professionals, they might be family, and they might just be friends. 
Um, that's really all it is. Uh, and again, like that term gets thrown around, but that's the core of it. And that support group can help you in a lot of different ways, but I think two of the key ways it can help you is those people in your support group can help you learn and gain access to relevant knowledge and tips related to the career path and industries and kind of jobs and opportunities you're pursuing. And also can um, actually literally provide you with opportunity. Like you might discover opportunities, whether that's an internship or a job, or it's an artist, you know, call for entry, or it's a grant, or it's an exhibition. You might discover opportunities that you otherwise would not have known about unless you were a part of that community or connected to that person. So it, the network can be helpful in these kind of two key ways. The other core thing I want you to take away is that, in my opinion, networking at its core, a big part of it at least, is asking people questions, is learning. It's basically the act of learning from other people's experience. So when you think about having conversations with professionals or having conversations with RISD alums or having conversations with your peers, like other students that you're curious to learn from, you can think about it almost like, what are the questions I want to ask? What do I want to learn? What do I want to discover? So I'm just going to cycle through some questions here that I think can be helpful, especially if you're kind of not sure how you might reach out and ask questions of a professional or an alumni. These are some questions that you can think about using. So for example, what types of projects do designers work on in your studio if they're you know, professionally working in a design studio or similar kinds of contexts? What skills are most valuable for designers to have at your company, at the company that this person works at? What tips do you have for creating a portfolio in the blank industry, fill in the blank? More on the fine art side, what do you look for in the artists that you show or represent at your gallery if you were you know, talking to somebody who's a curator or a gallerist or, or along those lines? What advice do you have for an emerging artist like me who does the kind of work that I do? What are the most important things that an emerging artist like me should be doing to support their career path earlier in their career? And this could be applied to anybody, but what's the favorite part, uh, what is your favorite part of the work that you do? And this can be revealing in terms of like really understanding what someone's passionate about or really understanding what drives them to do the job that they do or to create the work that they do or you know, whatever the case may be. So, there's a million other questions that you could ask, but I think sometimes when I meet with students, this is one of those questions, which is like, I don't know what to do with the conversation, or I don't know what I should be saying, and this can be a helpful guide. Um, but really, at the end of the day, like, just ask yourself the question, like, what am I seeking? What do I want to know? What do I want to know that I don't know right now, that I think this person who's at this organization or this artist who does this kind of work, what do I think they might be able to help me understand? And that, if you start with that question, you know, your networking conversations can kind of flow from there. My other big piece of advice, and as we move through the presentation, and I'm going to demo some things, and this will, this will get kind of more visually engaging. I know I'm kind of throwing a lot of bullet points at you right now, but I'm kind of trying to ground us in context. Um, my other big philosophy and belief around networking is that it's helpful to develop a strategy, develop a plan around it so that it becomes manageable and becomes something that you can tackle a little bit at a time instead of it being this like big mysterious thing that you don't really know what to do with. So here's my advice. Start by maintaining a list of your favorite design studios, architecture firms, production companies, animation studios, artists. Um, or cultural organizations, museums, galleries, nonprofits, whatever the case may be, whatever you're into, start to kind of like take stock of, oh, I see this out in the world and I align with this. This gets me excited. I would like to be a part of this kind of work. Start to kind of like track that and make a note of those places and build a list. Then from that list, you can set aside some time each month, you know, every couple of months even, if that's what you can manage, um, to dig into those organizations, to research them, 
to try to explore who's working there, who's affiliated with these organizations, and who might I connect with? How can I start to expand my network to reflect these places that I'm really interested in and learn about these places that I'm really interested in? And then, so the kind of last step is start to reach out, once you've done that research, start to reach out to these new connections um, or, and or, keep in contact with existing ones. If you've already reached out and had conversations, you can periodically check in with people that you already know just to update them what's going on with you or ask them about additional things that you haven't had the chance to talk with them about. This is a really simple, just Google spreadsheet that you can kind of use as a model, in a sense, for what that kind of networking planning and strategy can look like. Yours, yours doesn't have to look like this. This works for me. I've seen it work for other people. But whatever your system is, develop a system. But the basic idea is that you have like a home base, like a Google spreadsheet, where you're able to kind of note the companies that you're interested in or organizations that you're interested in, maybe track the kind of industry or field that they're involved in. If you have connections or if there's people you want to connect to at that organization, you can start to note that. And maybe even if they're a RISD alum, if you have their contact information, you can keep track of that. And then like a notes and next steps just to kind of stay on top of your progress so that you're not scrambling or you're not having to dig through your email to remember the last contact that you had with them or um, kind of, you know, worry about where you're at in the process of, of conversation with them. So again, there's all different variations of this. You can do this in your own way, but having some kind of home base like this makes this process a lot easier and allows you to kind of strategize and, and um, build a system around it. Cool. So I want to press pause real quick before we go to the next part. How are we all doing so far? Any questions about anything I've talked about? Making sense? Feeling okay? Yeah, go for it. The second question that you suggested for questions that you might ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question, and the answer is honestly, it's going to vary a lot depending on the type of place. So, just to give you an example, so like, I mean, I don't know, let's say it was like a production company, right, that does a lot of like film and video work. They might say, oh, we need people who have a lot of skill with um, like camera operation or editing software, and so like they might be able to kind of give you a sense of like, these hard skills and these software skills are really important and kind of give you clues that like if you want to work in this kind of environment, we encourage you to kind of like develop these skills. But that's going to look really different depending on the environment, right? Like if you then go to like, you know, let's say you were talking to somebody who is a sculptor or installation artist who had, runs their own small studio where they're making, but they also might employ like a small group of other individuals, they might say things like, fabrication skills and being able to do woodworking and metalworking is really important. So it's tough to answer that with one singular response. And that's actually kind of sort of the point of asking the question, right? Because depending on who you ask and what work they do and what industry they're in, their answer is going to vary. And even the answer will vary to some degree company to company or organization to organization, person to person you know, even within the same industry. So that's why that kind of question can be really valuable because you can get real insight about what's important at that place. And if that is a place that you maybe want to work or want to emulate in some way in your own practice, knowing what they value is really useful information for you. Um, it's especially useful while you're a student too. It's useful always, but while you're a student, so just taking this step further, while you're a student, you still have time to skill build, right? Like you can take classes in a certain area or you can, if you need to develop a software, you can, you know, ask a friend who's strong in that software to help you get better at it or you can take a, like on YouTube and take an online tutorial. Like there's all different kinds of ways for you to skill up in certain ways if you know that that skill is going to be particularly valued in the paths that you're pursuing professionally. Um, so does that help? That was a great question. 
I know I kind of gave like a varied answer, but but the reality is that the answer is it kind of depends on the place um, and what industry they're in or what work they do. Yeah, great question. I think there was another. Maybe yeah. Like, uh, I I want to have a career that's different than what I'm studying. What's my major right now? How can I do that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question too. So, <clears throat> the good news is you're you're not limited by your major, truly. Like, you're kind of only limited by your imagination and and how proactive you want to be. So, if you wanted to expand outside of your major, one of the things that I would start thinking about, kind of a little bit going back to something I showed earlier. So what? Um, what kind of work are you excited by outside of your major? Like, so for example, are there artists or designers or companies that are doing work out there in the world that you're like, that's cool. I would like to do that. It would be amazing if I could be a part of doing that work. So get inspired by what's out there in the world and then work backwards from there. So in other words, like see what's out there in the world, then see the people who are involved in producing that work or work at those companies or those organizations and start to make outreach to those individuals to build your network of people that are doing the kind of work that you're inspired by, whether it's in your major or not. Um, and back to this question, actually, one of the things you can ask those individuals is like, right now I'm studying this. I'd like to be doing the kind of work that you're doing what do you think is important for me to learn? What skills or abilities do I need to gain to be to be able to do the kind of job that you do or to be able to join the kind of organization that you work at? And then that can help you have a strategy to what you might need to learn outside of your major, if, if anything. That make sense? Yeah. And well, I'm going to show in a little bit, because I know I'm kind of like, I'm saying a lot that you can just like, find people and reach out to them like it's easy and it is actually easier than than you might think but I am going to show ways where you can find people tools that make that easy and also examples of like what you can say so hopefully that part will become a little bit clearer um, but that's a great question too anything else yeah um, when we talk about how should we keep contact with you yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that right now because that's a really good point. So the question was, so maybe, you know, after you've reached out and you've had some conversations, how do you keep that connection going, right? How do you sustain contact? And I think there's, there's no one perfect way to do that. There's no one only way to do that. But one of the best ways, I think, is, and this is another cool thing about being a student, you are, while you're at RISD, right, you're constantly producing new work. You're doing, you're involved in new projects, you're taking new classes, you're exploring new things, right? It's actually a really um, big advantage in some ways, in, in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that relates to networking is you can use that almost kind of as like an excuse for a reason to follow up with people. So in other words, if you are reaching out to peri people periodically, like you know every couple of months or once a semester, one of the things you can update them on is basically kind of say like, hey, I really enjoyed our conversation a few months ago. It was really helpful for me in understanding your work and, and getting a better sense for, um, you know, for the career path I'm considering. Um, I wanted to let you know, since we last spoke, I've actually created a couple new projects and I'd love to you know, be able to show them to you and, if you have any feedback on the work that I'm doing, that'd be super useful. I'd appreciate it. So to answer your question, one of the ways you can keep a sustained connection with somebody is just by updating them on what you're up to and what work you're doing and, and asking for their feedback, asking for their perspective and opinion on it. Um, that's, that's not the only way, but that can be a nice, convenient reason to reach out and update people over time. And it keeps the, keeps the connection alive. They're, through that, they're, they stay aware of what you're doing, they stay apprised of your new work, um, and and also your connection stays kind of vibrant and stable. Make sense? Yeah, and also, um, if they like answer to me questions for me, I feel um, I owe them a favor. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, is there any way I can like make up for 
Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that you can, it's a good point, one of the things that you can always do, and this is just, I think, good practice, is you can always offer, um, you can just basically say, especially like after you've had a conversation with somebody or they've answered your questions, you can always just say, like, this has been so helpful for me, I'm, I'm sincerely appreciative of everything you're telling me, if there's anything I can do for you or any way I can help you, please do not hesitate to reach out. So sometimes, especially while you're a student, sometimes just offering that and making it known that like, I would like to help you if I can, and if there's anything you can think of, by all means, let me know. Um, the other thing I'd keep in mind is you actually are helping them in a way, this might not seem it, but you actually are helping them in a way by reaching out, by developing the relationship, and um, sharing what you're doing with them. And I'll explain what I mean. So especially if this is, if we're talking about somebody who's like a professional, somebody who's an alum, they've been out in the field for a little while, it's actually really good for them to see what students are doing and understand what's happening at RISD, what are some new approaches in uh, education, what are you learning, what are new technologies that are being taught. That's actually useful for them to know because that's helpful for them to get a perspective on what the student experience is. It also can help them if they are involved in hiring at their company and sort of want to stay connected to emerging talent that could maybe join their studio or firm. So in a way, it's it's a it's a uh, it's a reciprocity. There's like a benefit to both sides, even though it might seem like you're getting all the benefit. Um, they do benefit from it, and and you never know in the future how you might be able. Them. And so by offering that help and just extending it, um, I think it'll be appreciated and they, they can always follow up with you in the future if they feel like they need your guidance or input or want to ask you your perspective. So just offering, honestly, is a, is a big move. And I would, I would just do that. That's a great question. Really good questions. This is awesome. Okay. I'm going to, again, we can do more questions, but I'm going to kind of cruise through <coughs> and show you, show you some stuff that'll help make the network So there's going to be three things. There's more than just three resources you can use to network, but I'm going to focus on three. Because for one, we don't have infinite time. For two, I don't want to overwhelm you. And these three, if I had to pick three, there's more than just these three, but if I had to pick three, these would be three that I would focus on. So we'll start with LinkedIn. Um, who's heard of LinkedIn? Most people, right? Who has a profile, most people, who feels good about using it or knows what they're doing. Yeah, it's always, the, it's always the case. Good for you. It's always the case, though. Most people are kind of like, I sort of get it, not really. Um, hopefully, you'll feel a little bit better about it. It's not a perfect platform, but it can do a lot. So I'll share some, some tips. One thing just before I get into like showing you some demos and stuff, um, just to sort of set the stage so that we're all kind of understanding LinkedIn. So there's a lot of different ways you can use LinkedIn. One and kind of the biggest known way is you create a professional profile and that uh, can be a, at least a part of kind of your like professional identity um, and the way people can view you in terms of, um, you know, your professional brand, so to speak, on the, on the internet. These next ones are sort of lesser known uh, resources or ways to use LinkedIn that uh, I'll show you that are also really cool too. So it's a very powerful tool to research creative industries and pathways. And it's also super powerful if you want to network and build connections within specific organizations or studios or companies, which we'll look at. I also just want to, this graphic is nice. It's actually dated at this point, so it's, it's actually more than 722 million members. It's probably in the 800s, if not more. Um, but it's worldwide. So the, the point with this is that it's a worldwide platform. So regardless of whether you are from the United States or you're from another country, or you want to remain in the United States after graduation, or you want to go and live and work in another place, either your home country or elsewhere, um, chances are LinkedIn could be useful because there, it's such a global presence and there's people that are uh, part of the LinkedIn network across the world. Um, so it's just a, it's a helpful thing to keep in mind regardless of where you see yourself ending up down the line. 
couple other like stats from LinkedIn just to kind of like prove its uh, reach and value. So like I said, 700 plus million members in 200 plus countries. It's also 50 million companies that use LinkedIn, which is just like a mind-boggling amount. Um, it's kind of wild to think that there's that many companies in the world, actually, but um, I'll show you this, but companies have the ability to create company pages on LinkedIn that they sort of manage and control, and those can be really, really useful. Also, 74% of users that were surveyed said LinkedIn helped them in researching, uh, finding people, and also researching companies that they might be interested in. And this one's a pretty mind-blowing stat too. 94% of recruiters and hiring managers, also known as talent acquisition professionals in some uh, circles, people who hire, in other words, 94% of those individuals are on LinkedIn and active, which basically means that if you're interested in getting hired for a job or an internship, there's a good chance that people who are involved in that process are on LinkedIn. So it might be a good idea for you to be active on the platform too. I'm going to start by showing you a profile in a second. Um, this will make more sense as I visualize it. A couple of key sections. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the profile. I'll show you a little bit tonight. Please know that if you want, if you really want to do a deep dive on your profile and get feedback and uh, opinion on it, you can come to our office. You can make an appointment, you can come to drop-ins, and somebody will be more than happy to like look at your profile and offer suggestions and uh, potential areas for improvement. So we'll touch on it a little bit here, but we won't spend too much time. Um, but the key sections for a LinkedIn profile, the top, which is like your tagline and summary, there's a featured section where you can share work, which I'll show. Um, an experience section, which is similar to the experience section you'd have on your resume. Skills and endorsements, which is also similar to what you might have on a resume, but there's some really cool things about what you can do with it on LinkedIn. Recommendations, which I'll show you, which is kind of a unique LinkedIn feature that doesn't really exist on a resume in the same way. Um, before I launch this, sorry, I'm going to back up. Okay. So I'm going to show you a little video screen recording I have uh, of an alum's LinkedIn profile, and I'll kind of narrate as we go through it. Um, not that his profile is perfect necessarily, but there are some really good things that are being done on there, and I think it will help illustrate some of these things that I'm talking about. So I just want to see that before we go to. So this is Nick Cole. Nick's an uh, illustrator. As you can see, he's got his tagline. He's got images of his work along with his headshot and the character designer illustrator tagline. He's also got an about section, which is important talks about what his core skills are, what his main focuses are. We just talked about what got him interested in art in general, which is really nice. Scroll down. This is the featured section. This is really cool. I recommend using this. You can literally add work to your LinkedIn profile. It's a great thing for artists and designers um, to do this. And it's also, you can link to your portfolio and all these other good things. Also have an experience section like you're seeing here very similar to what you have in your resume, except you can link work here as well, like connected to that job. So that can be a really good thing that you can do on LinkedIn that you can't really do quite the same way on a resume. Typical education section where you show where you studied and any activities or clubs you were a part of. Skills, you have the ability to highlight like three of your strongest skills, and then you can also add kind of an infinite number of skills beyond that. Recommendations, so this is super cool. So if you've worked with somebody, either at RISD or elsewhere, you can actually ask them to write a recommendation that gets added to your LinkedIn profile. So this is really cool. You're kind of seeing with Nick, he's actually got like professionals that are vouching for his work on his profile, which is a super cool thing. He's got like 20 of them. So I don't want you to be like looking at that and be like, I've got to have 20 recommendations. Nick worked as a freelance illustrator for like 15 years. So it took time to develop that. But if you've done an internship, or as time goes by, you do internships and you work, or, or you, like I said, you've got an on-campus job and somebody could recommend you for that, it's a nice feature to add to your LinkedIn because it's cool for somebody to hop on your profile and, and see that somebody else is like vouching for what it's like to work for you. That can be potent, and it's like, like you can't really do that on your resume in the same way. So I know that was like super fast-paced. Um, you can, you know, any one of you could check out Nick's profile. LinkedIn um, if you want to kind of take a closer look at it and like I said 
more than happy to, to sit down with you and talk more about it in a, an appointment or a drop in. Unfortunately, I want to do the videos again. Bounce back out because it's a little clumsy. <clears throat> so, another feature on LinkedIn that's super cool that I'm going to demo for you as well is the RISD school page. So, basically, every school, every college has a school page on LinkedIn. And why this becomes really useful for you is it's actually a very cool way for you to explore alums. So you can see alums and where they're living, so like popular cities that they're living and working in. You can easily see the organizations and companies that they're working at. And you can even dig deeper and like kind of select by major, which will show you and location to get like a very specific subset of um, looking by like people who studied this and live in this region where they live. So I'll show you what this looks like. So this is a RISD school page, and you click on the alumni tab. And so basically, it's showing you the 32,000 alums that are on LinkedIn, but you can narrow that. So what you're gonna see on the screen here is, I could say, I only wanna see alums in this example that studied like ID, let's say. Um, so there it goes, clicking on ID. Now, it's only going to show me the 3,000 alums that studied ID, and it's also sort of narrowed this infographic to just show me where the ID alums from RISD are working. And if I scroll down further, these are actual like profile previews of those people. So it's a cool way to like search by major, and I can even take this a step further and look by location. So I could say, I want to see ID alums, let's say, in the Bay Area, because maybe that's where I want to end up. And now it's sort of subset that even further giving me a preview of the top places that they work, and then the profiles of those individuals as well. For any of these, if I'm like scrolling and curious, or I see somebody who's like working at a place that I'm curious about, I can literally click on these profiles. So like I could click on Sophia here, because maybe I've heard of smart design where they work, and I want to learn more, or I want to potentially even reach out to Sophia. It makes it a really cool tool. I like how visual it is. I like how there's like the infographic piece. And it does allow you to kind of slice by region and by major, which might be a particularly useful way to explore alums, depending on where you want to live and end up. And it is worldwide, it is global. So I picked a city in the US, but you could do this for really any country that you wanted to if you don't want to remain in the US. Another feature of LinkedIn that I want to show you is the RISD Alumni LinkedIn group. So there is a group on LinkedIn that you can join. So even though it says alumni, you can join this literally right now um, as a student. So all current RISD students as well as all RISD alumni are eligible to join this group. There's over 10,000. So this is like the biggest RISD alumni group on LinkedIn that exists. There's over 10,000 uh, current students and alumni that are a part of it. That number actually represents about a third of literally all the living alumni in the world. So it's uh, it's a pretty significant number of people in one place. Um, and you can use it to explore the members, see what uh, they're posting. So I'll show you in a second, but people who are in the group sometimes post and share opportunities. The other cool thing about this to keep in mind, especially if you're like new to LinkedIn. So if you join this group, every other person who's in the group automatically becomes a part of your LinkedIn network. So like just by sharing a group on LinkedIn, they instantaneously become a part of your network and they're gonna show up in all your searches. It's gonna be super easy for you to connect with them. It just makes navigating LinkedIn a little easier. Easier. So joining groups is a really powerful thing on LinkedIn and joining this group in particular, because there's so many RISD alumni in it, is really gonna sort of like instantaneously give your LinkedIn like a boost in a sense. So this demo, um, this is just sort of what the group looks like, right? So once you've joined the group, there's postings. People are able to post updates on their work or able to post updates on um, things that they're involved in. This one that I'm going to highlight on, so the one from Kendra there, they're actually an alum who's posting like, hey, I work at Kansas State University. We're hiring a professor. Love to have a RISD alum join us if possible. Now, I'm not saying anybody, you'd all want to become a professor one day necessarily, but it is a cool way to like be aware of opportunities that alums are sharing. And of course, I can click on their profile and learn more about this person 
even see their experience and their background. How did they become a professor? What did they do while they were at RISD? Um, LinkedIn is powerful in this way in that you can see people's career paths because it's essentially their resume online. You get to kind of see what did they study? What were they doing while they were at school? Did they do internships? Did they do work study positions? And it just helps you sort of get a picture of like, how did this person get to where they are? Not that you have to copy another person's career path necessarily, but it can be informative and help you kind of make decisions about what you want to do. Um, and like I said, the LinkedIn group uh, can, you can find opportunities on there. People share stuff. This is another really potent thing. This will be the, the final thing I share about LinkedIn, which is I mentioned those company pages. So again, there's like 50 million companies that are on LinkedIn. So not every company is there, but there's a good chance that if you like have a company or a studio that you're interested in, they might have a presence on LinkedIn. And kind of similar to what we were doing with the RISD page earlier, there's a cool way for you to kind of like search these company pages. So I'll show you in a second, but basically, you can go to the company page and search for RISD um, alumni and see if there's RISD alumni working at places that you're interested in. So I'll just show you an example. So like, let's say I'm an architect and I'm interested in Gensler, which is like one of the top architecture firms out there. Literally just type in Gensler into LinkedIn, find their company page, go to their company page. A lot of good stuff on here, but I recommend checking out that people tab, which we're gonna click on in a second. When you click on that, this might look kind of familiar, right? This is sort of like what was on the RISD page. But what you can do is say, I only want to see people who work at Gensler who went to RISD. And now I see that there's 57 employees at Gensler that are on LinkedIn that studied at RISD. And if I scroll down, I'm literally seeing the people, which is really cool. And you can see their different roles and understand what, you know, different departments they're in and whatnot. Um, but if anybody piqued my interest, I'm a click away from clicking on their profile and like I said before, exploring what their background is, what did they do while they're at RISD so I can see that like for example Allison was a Maharam fellow. Um, so if I want to be a design strategist, maybe doing the fellowship might be a cool thing for me to explore. And of course, so it's kind of two layers to this, let me back up. So we're out of talk about network. So I, totally encourage all of you to like be brave and make outreach to people and just put yourself out there. But even if you're nervous about that, think about all that you could learn just by kind of doing this like investigating, right? Like just by looking at people's profile, just by seeing what their path was, just by learning about where alumni have ended up and where they're um, living and working. Like even before doing outreach to anybody, just this kind of stuff on LinkedIn can be super informative and useful. So I just want to kind of say that even if you're like hesitant to reach out to people, I still encourage you to do this type of stuff. So sort of a kind of secret, not secret, not intentional secret, but something that's maybe not as well known is the fact that RISD has alumni clubs and groups. So there's actually an alumni office at RISD that is responsible for um, supporting alumni and organizing these clubs and organizations so that alumni have easy ways to stay connected and easy ways to network and, and continue to build relationships even after you're done with RISD. So there's actually 50, over 50 alumni groups and they're kind of divided into two different categories. So there's 20 plus that are industry related. So in other words, you'll see some examples on the screen in a minute, but so like in other words, like RISD alumni that work in animation, for example. There's definitely a club for that. Um, there's also 30 plus regional clubs. So what that means is keep RISD alumni that live and work in a specific area. So there's um, where there's high populations of RISD alumni in United States cities, there's clubs, and then also globally too. In Asia, Europe, all over, all, all over the world. If you want, I'll show you where this is, but if you wanted to explore this further, you can simply just go to alumni.rizzi.edu um, and you can dig into this yourself. But to show you how this is kind of useful, so I'm literally on that website I just mentioned. I can click on connect and you see there's the regional clubs and the affinity clubs or affinity groups. And in this case, I'm clicking on, these are the industry groups, affinity groups is another name for it. 
And you can see as we scroll down, there's a pretty wide range of clubs based upon the different types of career paths um, and opportunities that RISD alumni pursue. It's a pretty awesome thing. Um, and let's just say in this example that I'm interested in entrepreneurship and maybe starting a business one day. There's a RISD Women in Business Club, right? And I can go into that, and on that page, I can you know, learn about what the mission of the club is and what they do, but I can also see the group leaders, so you're gonna see that in a second. So these are actual RISD alumni who run and manage that club. And so now I've got the names of individuals who are running this club, and I could, back to LinkedIn, I could hop over to LinkedIn, plug their names in LinkedIn, find their profile, and potentially reach out and connect with them and develop a networking relationship or a, a professional relationship with those individuals, understand what they're doing with the club, and also just better understand what they're doing in terms of business and entrepreneurship um, as, as women leaders. So that's just an example, just one example, but these clubs can actually be kind of like potent hubs for you to find people and do your own networking. Hopefully that, that kind of made sense. And like I said, a lot of people don't know about this, at least while they're students, so hopefully, hopefully you're able to kind of like tap into this now and get a head start. The last kind of core resource that I want to show you, and this is another thing that sometimes um, people aren't super tapped into while they're still in school, but it can be super, super potent, are what are often referred to as professional associations. So basically in a nutshell, professional associations are just organizations that are created by professionals and they support people within a specific field or industry. So it's basically just groups of people that come together and they're like, we're all animators, let's share information, let's share resources, let's help each other. We're all sculptors, let's share information, let's share resources, let's help each other. You get the idea. These professional associations can have lots of value for you in terms of networking and in terms of just your career in general. They a lot of times make it easy to find studios and companies related to that area that are doing work that you could be excited by. They also sometimes have like job boards that are specific to that industry or grants and resources that are specific to that area. So it can be, they're sort of like hubs of information in that sense. Um, and then also they do, to the point of networking, they usually make it really, really easy for you to find other professionals that are interested in the same things that you are and connect with them and, and develop relationships. If you're curious and you want to learn more about this, I'm going to demo something so you can kind of see the value of this, but on our website, so if you go to careercenter.rizzi.edu, in the top navigation there's a section called internships and jobs. If you just click on that, on that page there's a whole list of like basically all the majors at RISD, and on that page there's for each major job boards that are relevant to that major, and then on the other side it says like directories and organizations. And so what we have done is sort of curate a list of these kinds of organizations that are related to each major at RISD. So I don't want you to feel like you're like on your own to find these places. You can literally go to that page on our website and see places, organizations, professional associations that are related to your major. They may not be the only ones out there, but you can at least start there to get connected to these things. So I just want you to know that that's out there. I'm going to show you an organization right now just to illustrate the point. So it's called Climate Designers sort of what you might, it's sort of what it sounds like. This is actually an organization for designers who are interested in working towards climate change. They actually, on their website, have this cool feature where you can literally find other designers who are in the climate space. As you're seeing on the screen here, you can even search by like what skill set or what kind of um, design capabilities they have. And for all of these, these individuals have kind of like their own profile where they're contributing information about themselves. So I click on Charlene here, and you could read about what does Charlene do, what's their background, even samples of their project. There's links to their website, to their LinkedIn, so if you wanted to reach out connect and connect, it's very easy to do so. So this is pretty wild, right? Like, in this one instance, I'm finding a community of people, especially if I was interested in, in climate change and applying my design skills to it, where I can meet other individuals who are interested in that work. They also have chapters, so essentially like climate designer organizations based on cities around the world, so you can connect to other people in specific areas 
interested in the same kind of work and doing the same kind of work as you. Other, not every organization has this, but the other thing they even have is like they've created a guide for if you want to get started in doing this kind of work, here's what we recommend, right? So like here's how you can essentially break into this kind of industry. Here's how you can find opportunities. Here's what to do with your portfolio. All this kind of stuff, right? So not every professional association has this, but a lot of them do. And so this is a really important reason why connecting with these types of organizations can be useful. That guide actually was actually made by a RISD alum and they were kind of linked on that page. So it's gonna take a second to load, I think. But um, that guide was made by a RISD alum, Aiden Hudson Lepore, who does design work in the climate space. And so I'm showing this just to kind of like prove the point that's like, by finding these professional associations in these hubs, it can kind of start to web out from there in really cool ways where you can discover people that you might not have known otherwise that you may want to add to your network and build relationships with and find kind of common ground with. So this is obviously like a very specific thing, but Climate Designers is fantastic in how, how many resources and how many things they offer on their site. Um, and a lot of professional associations do stuff like this. Uh, maybe not quite at this level all the time, but this is, this is a pretty common thing that you might encounter. So I just wanted to show it as an example of why these associations can be really powerful hubs for your networking activity. There's a ton of these. So I'm gonna highlight like 12, and I'm not gonna go in depth on all of these, but um, it's really cool. Like basically, if you can think of like a niche or an area or a community of people, chances are there's an association for it. So one club for creativity is for um, designers of color, uh, National Organization of Minority Architects, you know, an association made up of minority architects, as you could guess. American Craft Co Council for Craft-Oriented Disciplines. Pow Arts is Professional Organization for Women in the Arts. AIA is for Architecture. AIGA is for Graphic Design and Visual Communication. Women Who Create is an organization that aims to uh, advance and spotlight uh, female creators. IXDA is the Interaction Design Association, so if you're into uh, UI UX, interaction design, physical computing even, uh, really cool organization. That one doesn't have a name that's up there, but that uh, furniture illustration is the Furniture Society, which is great for furniture designers. Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators is what it sounds like. It's a great um, organization that supports people who want to write and illustrate children's books. Queer Art for, for queer artists and designers, mostly for queer uh, visual artists. Uh, and then the Council for Fashion Designers um, of America is uh, for apparel design and textile design, a really terrific organization as well. Again, these are just 12 of like literally hundreds, but you get a sense that like, okay, chances are if I'm interested in a thing or my major, I'm gonna find an organization that's connected to it. I'm gonna pause. This is getting the home stretch here and this will be the last thing we talk about, but that all makes sense in terms of like those resources and how you can kind of tap into them and how they might be useful in finding people and growing your network. Sounds good. Yeah, go for it. You, yeah. Is there, was there a place where there's like a database for all the professional associations? Like that was yeah, that's okay. So I can show it at the very end. Um, but yes, the, the answer is we have a page on our website. It's on in the internships and jobs section, if you just click on that, what you'll see pretty quickly on that page is like we've got sections for each major at RISD, and in those sections, there's these types of work, like links to these organizations. Um, so it's a good starting point. I can show it later too, but yeah, that's that's where I would start. You can you know you can Google and do more research too because there you might find things that even that we don't know of. You know that happens, but um, that page is the starting point. Great question. Anything else? Yeah. Can I reach out to one of the RISD regional alumni clubs? Yeah. Y'all have one there and no one replied. Okay. What should I do? Yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, what I would do, so remember I said that the, the alumni office at RISD sort of helps support and manage those clubs? So, you can, and you can follow up with me too. That's not the office that I work in, but we could dig into that and kind of like explore what's going on with that club. It's possible that they're 
not as active, or they're you know, sometimes leaders change. So sometimes like one alumni is leaving club leadership and is transitioning to somebody else, and so if that happens, sometimes there's a lull in activity. Um, so we could investigate it. Like if you want to do it on your own, you could simply reach out to the alumni office at RISD and essentially just ask what you just did. But I'm also happy to help facilitate that too. Um, so. Hopefully that answers. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know specifically in that case what's going on, but um, sometimes it can be the case that club leadership is changing and that's a transition period sometimes. Yeah, that's a great question. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Nathan, who is the best person to contact for asking? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's um, kind of a layered answer in a way. So, when you are um, reaching out and networking, I, I encourage you to be like diverse in the way that you do that. Meaning, like reach out to different kinds of people and in different roles, and, and maybe for different reasons too. So I'll explain. Um, so there are oftentimes, especially at larger companies, um, there are recruiters. So their title is sometimes recruiter or talent acquisition specialist or professional, um, or hiring manager sometimes, or human resources manager is another one that you see. These are all people that are involved in the hiring process for a company. And so if you're interested in a, in a role, in an internship or a job at a company, um, it is appropriate for you to reach out to somebody like that, like a recruiter or talent acquisition specialist who's working at that company, and express your interest. Like essentially connect with them on LinkedIn and write a message and say, and introduce yourself briefly and then just say like, you know, I'd, I'd love it, you know, the possibility of an internship. Um, you know, if you haven't applied yet, you could say, you know, I'd appreciate any information you can provide about how to pursue an internship at your company and you know, be really excited to apply. You know, please let me know. That's appropriate. But I also encourage you to reach out to like professional like so like designers on the team or people who are on the creative side their title might change but people who are on the creative side too and if they're RISD alumni great but they don't have to be but with those individuals your approach is a little bit different so do you remember at the beginning and I'll we're going to kind of get into this a little bit here but um when I said like Networking is learning, and networking is about getting advice. That's especially the approach that you want to take with somebody who is like a designer or a design director or, um, you know, art director or whatever the role is that they have in the creative team. You want to not so much put it forth as like, hey, can you help me get an internship there? You want to do it more as like, I would love to learn from you. I love the work that you do. I want to learn from you. I want to better understand the work that you're doing at your company. Um, and yeah, it would be great also if I could share the work that I'm doing. Because first you want to establish a connection with that person. Because that person is not necessarily, like, their job is not hiring, right? Like they might be involved in hiring, but their job is to do the creative work, right? Their job is to produce whatever it is they produce. And so for them, I think you want, you really do want to make it about learning and gaining advice and making an authentic connection. And then through the development and building of that relationship, that person hopefully over time can become like kind of an ally for you. Like in other words, they can, they might be able to refer you if you do apply to something, they might be able to say like, oh, I met with so-and-so, I think they'd be a good fit, we should interview them or hire them. So that you can kind of think of those individuals as becoming allies, but I wouldn't recommend for, for those people in those roles, I wouldn't recommend like straight up just reaching out and being like, hey, can you get me an internship? Because that, especially if they don't know you, that could be a little too forward and a little too aggressive. So I know, I'm in a way, I'm kind of saying two different things, but it's important to keep in mind, like if the person is a recruiter or, or talent acquisition professional, like their job is hiring. Their job is finding talent for that organization. You can be a bit more direct with them because you're actually kind of helping them with their job by expressing your interest in potentially working for them. If it's somebody who's on the creative team, you, you that approach is is maybe a little too aggressive, especially if you don't know them yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
It's a really good question and kind of a nuanced answer, but hopefully that you can see the division there. Um, but to come back to it a little bit, my advice is connect with lots of different people at the organization. So ideally, if you can find recruiters and talent acquisition, uh, talent acquisition professionals, you connect with them. But hopefully you're also connecting with people on the creative team um, at different levels. You know, even like people who are closer to an entry level hire, people who are more managers, art directors, creative directors, etc. cetera. Um, getting different perspectives and learning from different people in the organization is always a good idea too. Is that a great question? Did that answer it? Cool, awesome. All right, I know we're, I know we're getting low on time here and you're, you've all been terrific, so I wanna try to wrap us up as quickly as possible. So, like I said, it's, I think, a uh, pretty common thing that people are sort of like, okay, like I want to make sure that I'm kind of approaching this in the right way and saying the right things. So when you're reaching out to professionals, I have a few tips for you in terms of like what to actually say like in the outreach. So especially if you like, you don't know somebody, if you're reaching out to somebody that you've never met before, keep it short. So short and sweet, make it very accessible for them. Briefly introduce yourself and explain how you learned about them. So maybe you came across your in profile or maybe their your professor mentioned their work in a class and you explored it through that. Could be anything. And express your enthusiasm for that person's work, for what they do. Like why are you reaching out and connecting? Because you're excited about what they do and you kind of feel connected to it or aligned to it in some way. And this back to the point we were just making, portray yourself as an advice seeker. So make the outreach about learning about asking for advice, asking for help, not so much about can you get me a job or can you get me an internship or can you hire me for a freelance opportunity. Especially if you don't know the person, that could come across a little too interesting. And then limit your ask in that initial message to like one pretty easy minor thing. Like again, just make, make their life easy. So here's just a rough example of what this could look like. <clears throat> so this person is reaching out to this individual, Lynn, who the context behind this is that Lynn is a, a director of creative placemaking at LISP, which is, if you've never heard of it, is just an organization that works to support um, uh, creative cultural projects in local communities. So it's actually a really cool position and a really cool uh, organization. So in this case, Romel is reaching out to Lynn because they found him on LinkedIn, okay? So Romel says, hey Lynn, my name is Romel. I'm a senior at RISD studying sculpture. I came across your profile on LinkedIn, and it was so great to see that you're a grad from RISD working in the public art sector uh, as the director of creative placemaking at LISC. Most of my personal work involves creating interactive sculptural installations that engage the public and encourage a sense of community. It's something that I'm really passionate about, and I hope to continue to do that work after graduating. I would love to connect with you. I'm hoping we can speak briefly sometime about creative placemaking and the work that you do at LISC. It's really inspiring to me to find an alum working in a field that I'm excited about. I would be grateful to learn from you. Thanks. Look forward to hearing from you. So the ask, right? So they're they're establishing why they're interested in them. They're kind of forging a connection between the work that Lynn does in this case and the work that they do as a sculptor. And their ask is basically like love to connect and chat sometime. Like that's, that's it. They're not asking for an internship. They're not asking for, you know, can you give me a grant so that I can do a, a sculptural installation that I want to do. Like we're not making this big ask before we've started to establish a relationship. So, you know, everybody's tone is different and you might have a slightly different language and tone here, but this will give you a sense of how you can approach it. So that would be the outreach that you might make if you've never met somebody and you're trying to kind of like start up a relationship. In terms of the actual conversation, so hopefully that email turns into like a Zoom conversation or you meet for coffee or you have a phone conversation. Um, so when you get to that stage of the conversation, here's what I recommend. So one of the things you wanna do, and I'll talk about this in the next slide briefly, but you want to be able to prepare like a brief, what's kind of called an elevator pitch. It's basically just like a succinct introduction so that when you're meeting somebody for the first time, you can explain 
who you are, what you do, what you care about in one to two minutes, roughly. Um, I'll give some more tips on this, but it's basically just like you thinking about how do I want to like convey what I do and what I'm about to somebody in a short amount of time so that they can like understand what I'm about pretty quickly. You also want to come to that conversation ready with some specific questions. So just remembering back to when we started, I had that list of questions that you can be asking people. That's what I mean. You just want to come in with like, what do I want to learn? What do I want to ask this person? You also maybe want to be prepared to show your work in case they ask, um, you could you could certainly bring it up too. You could say like you know if, if you're up for it, I can show you my work real quick. I'd love your feedback or your opinion on what I'm doing and how it relates to what you do. So you might want to be prepared to do that. And then this is a kind of forgotten thing, but especially towards the end of the conversation, always ask like if they have any ideas for other people that you should talk to, either in their organization or in other orgs or other companies or organizations you should connect with. The idea behind this is that like this one person, their network and their suggestions can then help you grow yours, right? Like they may have suggestions of places and people that you should connect with that you would never have thought of. And so you're kind of leveraging that person's knowledge to help you grow and expand your own network. So I mentioned the elevator pitch and this will be the last thing. Um, don't get too intimidated by this and don't like stress out about whether you have this perfectly. This is something that you, you just kind of like work on over time. But this is basically just like thinking about what's unique about you, what do you care about, and why do you do what you do as an artist or a designer. So it's just a few prompting questions you can think about to help you with this. So what do you make and why do you make it? It's actually like just answering those two questions is actually kind of a really good basis for an intro or an elevator pitch. What kinds of questions do you like to explore or what questions drive your artistic practice or your design practice? What types of problems do you like to solve and do you enjoy working on the most? Or what aspects of your creative process, be that artistic or design, um, do you are like most important to you or do you think are like maybe unique to the way that you work specifically? So I'll, I'll go back and I'll take a photo if you want to take a photo of that. So we're at the end. Just a few like recap and kind of parting advice. So I hope you're not intimidated by networking and I hope like this talk has made it a little easier to grasp. My suggestions to you, develop a plan. So like make networking a little bit more manageable for yourself and develop a strategy. Find your own personal networking hubs. So again, that's like the alumni you want to connect with, maybe the alumni affinity groups, maybe those professional associations that you are most aligned with. Find those places and that will just organically help you develop a network. Be fearless. Put yourself out there. I know this stuff is scary. Like I, you know, I've been doing this work for 12 years. I still get nervous sometimes like networking I think it's just normal for, for human beings. Like, not everybody's like that, but like I know a lot of people are. So it's okay. But like, try to just like be brave, put yourself out there, introduce yourself to new people. The uh, director of our office likes to say something that I think is very true, which is like, if you do nothing, nothing happens, right? So if you don't put yourself out there, if you don't take action, if you don't try to grow your network, it's going to be stagnant. Nothing's going to really happen. You're not going to get any of the benefits from it. So you do have to kind of like take that first step and just try to be fearless in that. And then the last thing and probably the most important thing is just be yourself. Um, I think like that's the biggest takeaway from networking. Like we kind of talked a lot about the strategy and the things you should be doing, but ultimately do this in a way that feels good for you, that feels real for you, that feels authentic for you. I don't want you to do anything you don't feel comfortable with. And networking at the end of the day, like I said, is really just about building a community, building relationships with people that you're like excited by mm -hmm. and they believe in that can help you and you can help them. That's it. And so if you do that and you're yourself, you're going to be fine.